Welcome back, my friends, to the Real News Network podcast. I'm your host, Mel Buer. I wanted to take a moment to thank you once again for tuning in to us week after week. Whether you've got our shows on while you're making coffee in the morning, put our podcasts on during your commute to and from work, or give us a listen throughout the workday, the Real News Network is committed to bringing you ad-free, independent journalism that you can count on. We care a lot about what we do, and it's through donations from dedicated listeners like you that we can keep on doing it. Please consider becoming a monthly sustainer of The Real News Network by heading over to therealnews.com forward slash donate. And if you want to stay in touch and get updates about our work, then sign up for our free newsletter at therealnews.com forward slash sign dash up. As always, we appreciate your support in whatever form it takes. Since the self-immolation of U.S. Airman Aaron Bushnell in protest of the U.S. government's involvement in the Israel-Palestine war on February 25th of this year, his self-avowed anarchism and anti-authoritarian ideology has been the subject of much conversation with top Pentagon officials fielding questions from reporters about what they are calling extremist views. Since Bushnell's protest, anti-Zionist activists have invoked his memory and final words at demonstrations across the world, and the town of Jericho in Palestine has named a street after Bushnell, with the mayor of Jericho saying at the unveiling ceremony, quote, We didn't know him, and he didn't know us. There were no social, economic, or political ties between us. What we share is a love for freedom and a desire to stand against these attacks on Gaza. Should government officials call Bushnell's act of protest a, quote, act of extremism. It could kick off another round of investigations of left-leaning individuals, both within and outside of the military. With me today to discuss this and to expand upon the dangers of the U.S. government once again casting a wider surveillance net of its civilians is Ken Klippenstein, reporter for The Intercept, who has covered the government's response to Aaron Bushnell's death extensively. Uh, Welcome to the show, Ken. Thanks for coming on. Hey, good to be with you. Okay, so you've covered Aaron Bushnell's self-immolation for the last few weeks, both at The Intercept and on your personal substack. And we've seen this extreme form of protest demonstrated a number of times, both at home and abroad in the last 15 years. But in Aaron's case, this seems to be particularly unique in that he was an active duty U.S. service member. Why is this an important distinction to make? Well, the fact that he's an active uh, duty service member means that he falls under, you know, the administrative system that the military has. And a focus that they have had post January 6th has been on uh, rooting out um, so-called domestic violent extremism, um, particularly in extremism in general among its ranks. Um, and so the context in which that's happening has been, um, you know, very criti- uh, very bitterly criticized by uh, particularly right wing quarters in Congress, because um, a lot of the focus has been on uh, white nationalists, white supremacists, has been, and I, you know, quote in the story, a few examples of this, um, prominent senators on these relevant committees, Republican senators saying, hey, why don't you guys go after the left wing so-called extremists as well? And in fact, after um, Bushnell's death, Senator Tom Cotton, Republican on the Armed Services Committee, former service member himself, sent a letter to DOD, just sent another letter um, subsequent to my story coming out, demanding that they uh, respond to a series of questions about um, what they're doing about left-wing extremism and so-called pro, pro-Hamas pro extremism. Uh, and I want to be clear, there's no evidence that that um, Bushnell was pro-Hamas as far as I could tell. But um, the question is, how is DOD going to respond to that? Because once they've been tasked with something like that, you know, it's likely that they'll have to respond to pressure from Congress. And so what is that going to mean for other service members in the, in the DOD? who might have similar left-wing tendencies as uh, as Bushnell did. Right. Um, you know, I've seen some, I would say, uh, you know, anecdotal sort of armchair opinions on, on places like Twitter, uh, now X. And, um, you know, I think a lot of folks are, are curious, would it be fair to say that Aaron's death has sort of triver- triggered it kind of a bit of a reckoning within the ranks of the U.S. military? Is there anything in your reporting that you've kind of noticed where that sort of sentiment, that conversation is happening amongst uh, not the higher ranks, but just, uh, you know, your sort of uh, rank and file, if you will, military service members? Yeah, there's kind of two reactions. One is at the highest level. So, for example, um, the Pentagon Press Secretary, Brigadier General uh, Pat Ryder, um, responded to a question within you know, days of of uh, Bushnell's death, people were asking, "Oh, isn't this an example of extremism?" And he said, um, "Yes, clearly this is an extreme 
act kind of hinted that that those are the lines along which they're 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 looking at this at this incident. But at the rank and file level, I mean, you know, I think people had a sort of just you know human moral shock, as one would expect, and as is the point of this kind of an action, I guess, to it. Uh, just you know, anecdotally talking to the rank and file that I, you know, you know, people were surprised by. It. They were just like, oh my god, this is you know, who would do this? Mm -hmm. um, but then at the, at the, at the, you know, senior most level, I think it, the, the response is much more political. I think something that people need to understand about these agencies is they're under a lot of pressure from Congress. And so whenever something like this happens, there prevails this kind of both sides attitude where they want to say, Hey, look, we're taking the left wing seriously, just like the right wing too. And that's really been enhanced after January 6th because right. of the, because of the response. And I think that in some respects, this is something that the left didn't really anticipate, which is that um, anytime they go after either political tendency, there is a lot of political incentive for them to try to balance it out with an equal and opposite response, or at least similar response to the other, to the, to the opposite political tendency to say, Hey, look, we're not politically partisan. We go after everybody because Congress provides them with their appropriations and funding and they have oversight and so on and so forth. So I think that really co colors the response to this is people's perception of the, um, you know, and the fact of the post January 6th response to, you know, per perceived problems within the culture of DOD. Yeah, I know that the FBI sort of painted their investigations post January 6th with a pretty broad brush. I mean, I myself got a door knock from the FBI for innocuous tweets about uh, the 2020 protests right after January 6th. Wow. Um, so, you know, in your most recent reporting, you, you've been asking these important questions about the ways in which these agencies are responding to Aaron's death. But also, you know, I think it's important to kind of talk about the sort of wider implications for activists in this country. They've, the FBI has focused considerable time and resources on investigating and imprisoning individuals that they believe to fall into these five extremist, domestic extremist categories, as you've reported on particularly since 2019 when they kind of set that standard for their investigations. But even before that, I'm thinking of, you know, anarchists who were imprisoned and harassed by the feds in the wake of the anti-war movement, the Iraq war anti-war movement. I'm thinking of, you know, most famously anarchist Scott Crow was stalked by federal agents for years after Katrina. So, you know, we're seeing these investigations kind of happen, especially in the wake of January 6th. You know, I think that a good place to provide more context for our listeners is, um, you know, what are these categories that they uh, sort of categorize individuals that they are in get investigating under this umbrella of, quote, violent domestic extremism in the United States? Yeah. So since 2019, the FBI has had, um, like you said, five uh, threat categories. I'm going to read them off to you now so folks can get a sense of what these are. So one is racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism. Two is anti-government or anti-authority violent extremism, um, which they use the acronym AGAVE for, anti-government or anti-authority violent extremism. Third is animal rights or environmental violent extremism. Fourth is abortion-related violent extremism, which obviously has become much more of a focus, not just in the part of the um, left, but again, trying to balance out the scales. I've done reporting on this as well. And what they try to do is they say, okay, look, you know, there are people that shoot up abortion clinics and things. Right. If you look at the like actual, you know, death count, that's much higher than the opposing tendency, you know, which might be vandalism and that sort of thing, you know, you know, pro, pro abortion um, advocates. Uh, but again, they try to use resources to go after both of them so that they can justify to Congress that they're because, you know, if they don't, then one or one of either of the political parties is going to start yelling at them and say, hey, why are you making all these cases about this side, not the other one? The point I want to kind of drive home in this interview is just that as soon as you open up this Pandora's box of using these agencies to pursue, you know, whatever you might think constitutes terrorism, if it if it's not a real ironclad example of terrorism, it's going to get deployed against both sides. And that's, a, right. that's something I've seen again and again. So what's interesting about the um, agave designation, anti-government, anti-authority, violent extremism, that can include um, things like sovereign citizens, which are traditionally sort of right-wing or libertarian, potentially white nationalists. Well, I guess that would be racially, eth ethnically motivated. But um, the point is it can include both right and left. So anarchism is a left-wing tendency, um, but there are also right-wing anti-government tendencies. So again, every single one of these des designations comes with a lot of opportunity for the Bureau to pursue uh, both sides of the political aisle. Yeah, and you you reported uh, in this most recent reporting that the FBI data reveals that 31% of its investigations relate to this agave, and 60% of those investigations include cat cases categorized 
as agave or civil unrest, which is obviously going to include things like the insurrection, right? But also includes uh, continued sort of surveillance and investigations of left-wing dissidents who maybe espouse anarchist or anarchist-related views online or elsewhere. Do you see this percentage rising uh, in the future, especially now that Congress is putting exponentially more pressure on these agencies to to continue these investigations? Yeah, in the past several years, um, cases, I think investigations into domestic violent extremists has more than doubled. So we are seeing a, a just soaring increase in the resources and attention brought to bear on these types of concerns. Again, in part because of January 6th, but it's a little bit more complicated. If you go back to the, uh, what was his name? Uh, George Floyd protests. That was a huge source of agita um, to the Trump administration and the intelligence and national security sector. In, in addition to, um, you know, un unrest related to coronavirus, January 6th. So basically all of these swirl together. I think January 6th is the strongest example in terms of precipitating a government response. But all of this created a sort of maelstrom by which, again, both the right and the left, both Trump, I mean, you remember Trump said that he wanted to designate Antifa a terrorist group. So I think what you see is this kind of race to the bottom where unfortunately both political tendencies end up trying to cast or paint their opponents as domestic violent extremists or terrorists. And the, and the segment of the society that really benefits from that is the national security state, because then they have a new, um, then they have political capital to be able to pursue some of these things and expand their authorities. And I think that's essentially what we've seen. Well, and there's a lot of money that's going into these agencies in order to conduct these investigations. Well, and they're sending money elsewhere as well. There's counterterrorism programs in universities, particularly in Nebraska, that are cropping up as a result of the FBI getting more military funding from the government. And yeah, everyone loses. Everyone loses, right? I, I think it's also important to kind of just bring this out. Folks may not really be able to see the sort of forest from the trees, right? And you're, you're bringing some interesting and good points in here about who wins in this scenario. We don't as citizens, right? Uh, the security state is the one that wins in this scenario. They get to uh, have way more power in order to quell dissent of any kind, in order to chill any sort of form of protest, and, you know, if you follow the reporting at The Intercept and at The Real News, you get the sense that piece by piece, case by case, from Jessica Resnichik to Bushnell, the carceral state is preparing for a pretty dark future as we move into uh, successive sort of crises that this country is falling under. Yeah, to give you a kind of 10,000 foot view of what's happening in the intelligence community right now, they've officially drawn down the globe, what's called the Global War on Terror, GWAT which is really the animating focus, the reason for being in over the last 20 years, basically my entire, you know, adult life. And so, you know, these agencies don't just take their ball and go home and say, all right, you can have your money back. They're going to try right. to find some new um, justification or purpose. I mean, I don't mean to suggest that there's some, you know, nefarious conspiracy going on by which they're trying to make up a cause. I know a lot of the guys in these agencies, they believe this stuff, they want to help, they think they're doing the right thing. And, you know, I have to be honest, I, I understand people's um, fear and concern. I mean, there are very, you know, a lot of the stuff is very scary. I'll give you an example. You know, anytime there's a mass shooting, you know, the discourse swings towards, all right, this guy's a terrorist. We've got to charge him with terrorism. I mean, you look at what happens, it is horrifying and, 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 and gross and, and depressing. And I understand why people are scared. I just hope that they can try to interrogate some of their, you know, thought process behind, okay, what road are we going down if we charge this person with this? Um, January 6th is another good example. You know, it's awful that there are people trying to, you know, uh, use use violence and furtherance of political aims, things like that. Um, but you've got to really look at the specifics and break down, okay, was this a consciously thought out strategy of terrorism and coercion? I think perhaps uh, if you, you look at the cases, it's it's quite varied. Different people have different motives. And, and I just wish there'd be a little bit more introspection about how we how we go about. I think you, there's a there's a way you can respond to this with with the rule of law that punishes people for things they did that doesn't necessarily you know, break the glass and hit the red button of, of you know, let's let's cast this as terrorism. And and I think that nuance is just lost in in the media discourse around it, the political discourse. And and as you said, the sector that that ends up benefiting is this national security system that is looking for a reason to exist post uh, war and terror. And so uh, one of their focuses is called the um, so-called great power competition, focused on Russia, Iran, China, but that's all foreign. At the same time, they have um, brought to bear a focus domestically in a major way that I don't think there's precedent for in our lifetime. And that 
domestic focus is these terms we've been talking about, domestic violent extremism, far right, far left. And again, there needs to be a debate about this because there is, I certainly have not seen much you know, discussion about, okay, is this something we want to do? Is this something that we, I mean, because if people decide that, I mean, certainly people are concerned about extremism, no question. I am too. But but there doesn't seem to have been any sort of, you know, conscious decision to, to, to go in this direction. It feels like they're just sort of uh, drifting towards it. And that's what I'm hoping to trigger a little bit of with this, with this, with these stories. Right. Well, I mean, the wider net you cast, the more innocent people get swept up into it. Right. And, you know, I'm of the mind that the more leeway we give the federal government to do this kind of work, to cast these wide nets and, you know, pick apart people's lives, uh, whether or not they intend to react violently to things that the government is doing is a dangerous place to be. And, you know, I think a lot of folks don't really know how to really have those nuanced conversations or feel like they have any sort of empowerment. They don't feel empowered to be able to to sort of influence that sort of space because the national security state and the, the higher echelons of government feel so different and distant from what they think they can do. So, uh, you know, I wonder if uh, you have any takeaways from your reporting that kind of helps people kind of center themselves and focus themselves on, um, you know, actionable steps that could potentially be taken in order to influence how the government is using these uh, agencies. Yeah, I guess I would just um, su suggest for people to look at the underlying evidence. I, I cite in this story um, the fact, which I was surprised to learn, I didn't know was true, that extremism among um, service members in the military this is a Rand Corporation study. It's actually lower or similar on, in many respects because, you know, it's a diverse agency more than a lot of other agencies. It's more reflective of the uh, general population. You know, I have plenty of criticisms of the Defense Department. You could read my reporting to find them, no shortage. Mm -hmm. um, but, to, but to, you know, cast this as some kind of hotbed of extremism, the, the data just doesn't really bear that out. And because of that, you know, we need to approach these things with some measure of equanimity and and you know reflection about okay do we really want to have this sledgehammer response to this um, when you know President Biden first came into office I think in his first full day of office he put out a statement saying we we're going to prioritize you know responding to domestic extremism task the intelligence community with creating a report they created their first ever report on it and then that sends the signal to all these agencies downstream that this is what we're taking seriously and this is what we need to focus on again how much of a debate was there about that i, I don't want to you know i don't i'm not suggesting that people aren't concerned about those things particularly after january 6th and and the unrest in 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 2020 i get it um but that's but being worried about something is different than than in in some deliberative process you know going through and, and considering the pros and cons um of this kind of response i just want to quote from you a, a t some testimony that Republican Senator Chuck Grassley was the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, very powerful committee that has oversight of the FBI and DOJ, um, said to the FBI director, uh, Chris Ray, I think it was maybe a year or two ago, um, he said, quote, how do you plan to make your left-wing anarchist extremism program as robust as your white supremacy and malicious extremism program? End quote. That's it. So they are not even hiding it. This is a political football for both sides right. um, to try to advance, you know, their their political aims. And again, I would ask people who wins on that. You know, I mean, you might win one play, the other team might win another play, but in the end, you know, how who is this benefiting? And and that's something I'd like people to sort of ask themselves. Yeah, I remember the Biden administration releasing that that report, that investigative report, and I remember reading through it a couple of years back and being kind of shocked again at the. You know, they paint the the cases of air quotes for our listeners, um, violent extremism uh, as with a very broad brush, right? They're casting a wide net. And again, this just opens up more chances for these agencies to investigate uh, regular citizens who may engage in what should be protected free speech, for example, and who end up mired in the courts for years sometimes, right? They use these to, to quell any sort of dissent. And, you know, we are talking about both types of dissent on both sides of the ideological spectrum. But again, we don't, we don't win in this scenario. And the, the federal government is the one who gets to, I don't know, pull a Patriot Act part two, right? Um, and engage in, in much more sinister sort of surveillance of its citizens uh, as a result of these types of conversations. So... I don't know, man. Uh, any other thoughts, final thoughts about this reporting or what you think is, uh, you know, what what are we looking at in the future? Are we looking at more of this kind of investigative 
nightmare, I suppose. Well, we're going to see what the um, military's response to Bushnell's death has been. I mean, when they're tasked with a series of questions that somebody on the relevant um, armed services committee to answer, uh, there very likely is going to be some kind of response. And in addition to that, should President Trump come into office, what his version of the response to domestic extremism will look like. So all of this is still very, I mean, very much not in the past and still being decided actively um, right now. All right. Uh, Well, thanks for coming on and thanks for giving us some important context here for our listeners and, and, you know, keep doing the good reporting that you do. I love reading your work. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. That's it for us here at the Real News Network podcast. Once again, I'm your host, Mel Buer. If you love today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notified when the next one drops. You can find us on most platforms, including Spotify and YouTube. If you find us on YouTube, be sure to drop a like and a comment down below, and I will do my best to respond to everyone. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can find me on most social media. My DMs are always open. Or you can send me a message via email at mel at therealnews.com. Send your tips, comments, questions, episode ideas, gripes, whatever you'd like. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for sticking around, and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.